Hello and welcome to Sociology 3, Module 9, video lecture on logical fallacies, one of my favorite topics when it comes to critical thinking. So we're transitioning into a part of, a, part of the course where what we'll start to do is evaluate the arguments that we come across. Recall that for the last few weeks we've been working on identifying the basic components of an argument, issues, conclusions, reasons, unstated assumptions, uh, all those basic parts of an argument that an author usually presents to us. Now we're going to start talking about how it is that we evaluate the quality of these arguments. So after you have, have identified these basic components of an argument, the issue, the conclusion, the reasons, and of course any ambiguous terms and values, you're really ready to move on to judging the acceptability of the conclusion. And this is what I mean by evaluating an argument. So in doing so, what we're really doing is making assessments of the worth or the value or the quality of the author's reasoning structure. So in doing so, we often come across what are called fallacies. Uh, logical fallacies is a very common way of referring to fallacies or sometimes reasoning fallacies. So a fallacy is basically faulty reasoning, a faulty argument. We can also think of it as a trick that an author uses to persuade us to accept the conclusion. And there are really three common categories of reasoning fallacies. And we're going to talk about each of these individually. Authors will often provide reasons that require erroneous or incorrect assumptions, which is not a valid basis of an argument. They will also often distract us with information that's not actually relevant to the conclusion. And finally, they'll sometimes try to provide support for the conclusion that really depends on the conclusion already being true. And this is often referred to as circular reasoning. So I want you all to remember, all of these reasoning or logical fallacies, really what they entail is the author's not providing sufficient or correct reasons for you to support their conclusions. That's what they all have in common. So there are a lot of logical fallacies, and I do not expect you to remember each of these. There are 13 that uh, Brown and Keeley talk about in the chapter for uh, this week. Uh, and I've, I've named them here. There are certainly more than 13 uh, that Brown and Keeley didn't get the chance to talk about. So my goal here is not to have you remember all of the different fallacies. I think it's prohibitively difficult to do so. Uh, and you can always go back and look in your text. But what I want to do is I want to talk in the rest of this lecture about some really common examples of those three categories of fallacy. And if you start to become really familiar with those three different categories, then that becomes easier for you to identify the many different fallacies that people often commit. So this list here is, uh, includes some of the most common types of logical fallacies. So that first category, providing reasons that provide erroneous or incorrect assumptions, uh, the example I want to talk about here, an incredibly common logical fallacy called the slippery slope fallacy. I love the name of that. It really helps me remember what it means. So this entails making the assumption that a proposed step, that one step, will set off an uncontrollable and often disastrous change of events, undesirable events, when in fact procedures really do exist to prevent such a chain of events from actually occurring. So a hint here is you can often tell when someone's committing the slippery slope fallacy when an author's making an argument claiming that a particular practice, something relatively small, shouldn't be initiated because it would lead to a much more extreme and, and often ludicrous outcome. So here's an example. So this is why I have this picture of this man dressed in a suit and tie standing next to a plant. Uh, and this is actually an argument that some people have used to undermine the case for allowing same-sex marriage. So my point here in raising this example is not to make it clear about whether or not we should allow same-sex marriage, but just to get you to pay attention to the reasoning structure here. So say a person tells you, if we allow two members of the same sex to marry, what will keep people from marrying their pets or even inanimate objects like plants and tables? Can you see the uh, fallacy here? Can you see the fallacious reasoning? So what this person is actually saying, if we allow this one thing to happen, one step, two members of the same sex to marry, then there's going to be this disastrous ch chain of events, that slippery slope. Uh, you can kind of think of something rolling down a slippery hill. People are going to want to marry their pets or they're going to want to marry furniture, etc. cetera. Uh, and what's really fallacious or faulty about the reasoning here is obviously 
uh, laws are not going to allow people to uh, marry things like plants, and allowing for same-sex marriage would not necessarily lead to that particular outcome. So this is an example of when an author is providing an erroneous assumption, making an erroneous assumption to get you to accept their conclusion. Other fallacies that are based on erroneous or incorrect assumptions include the searching for the perfect solution fallacy, the appeal to questionable authority fallacy, the either or, or what's often called the false dilemma fallacy, the planning fallacy, and the glittering generality fallacy. So I'm not going to go over all of these on the video because Brown and Keeley do a wonderful job of explaining what these are, but just know it does fit into this first category of fallacious reasoning based on incorrect assumptions. So the critical question we want to ask ourselves here is, are the reasons provided by the author, are they actually true? Or do they rely on any faulty assumptions, such as the fact that if we allow same-sex marriage, people will then want to go and marry their couch? Uh, that's an incorrect assumption, right? So this is a really good question that will key you into finding this type of fallacy. The second major category uh, is faulty reasoning, logical fallacies that really entail the author distracting us with information that's not so relevant, it's not really related to the conclusion. So the example I'm going to use here is the red herring fallacy. This is when an author presents an irrelevant topic, irrelevant to the issue at hand, intended to divert our attention away from the original issue that we are actually talking about. So the hint here is you can always tell someone's committing this logical fallacy when what they're trying to do is shift your attention as the reader away from one topic to another, uh, or shifting it right from the topic that they're actually talking about uh, to one that's not really related. So you might be curious as to why I have a picture of a little red fish. <laughs> uh, that's actually, some of you may already know this, but that's actually what a herring is. A herring is a fish. And so I always remember the name of this logical fallacy by thinking if I saw a really bright red fish swimming by, uh, that would probably distract me from whatever else it was that I was focused on. So hopefully my little cartoon there in the center will help you remember the name of this fallacy. So an example of the red herring fallacy is someone who might say, we can't worry about the environment now, we're in the middle of a recession. Well, why is that a red herring fallacy? Well, because just because we're in the midst of a recession, yes, we should care about the economy and try to do what we can to improve the economy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't also focus on protecting our environment. You see there the author is really, right, we're talking about the environment and this person is completely trying to shift us, shift our attention, distract us um, to the recession as a way to divert our attention. Uh, from what we were talking about, which is the environment. So be really careful when people really try to shift your focus very quickly, because if they're not actually talking about the issue at hand, chances are they're committing this type of fallacy. Other fallacies that are based on distracting information, information that's not actually relevant to the inclusion, include the ad hominem fallacy, a very common fallacy where you basically attack um, the speaker, or you attack the person that you're talking about and their personal qualities rather than actually uh, talking about the issue. Uh, also the appeal to emotions fallacy, the straw person fallacy, which is really misrepresenting someone's argument to make it easier to attack, and the explaining by naming fallacy. So if um, you ask yourself the critical question of, does the author provide sufficient reasons for the conclusion that actually address the issue at hand, and your answer to that question is no, then chances are they're committing one of these fallacies that are really based on distracting information. And you really want to question the reasons they're providing, because they should be talking about the issue that's actually um, central to the debate. And finally, we have um, and there's really only one uh, fallacy that Brown and Keeley talk about that fit into this category. Uh, we have providing support for the conclusion that depends on the conclusion already being true. So the primary example here is the begging the question fallacy. And this entails making an argument in which the conclusion is already assumed in the reasoning. Uh, a hint here is uh, this is also called circular reasoning. You can kind of think of someone going around and around in circles as they're talking about an issue. That the conclusion they're giving you is not really all that different than the reasons. So an example here would be, this piece of art is trash because it's obviously worthless. 
Well, they're concluding that the piece of art is trash, and the reason they're giving you to support this conclusion is because it's obviously worthless. But you need to ask yourself, saying something's a piece of trash and saying that it's obviously worthless, those don't actually mean anything different. You see why it's called circular reasoning? Because you just kind of go around in circles. And of course, this is why I include the picture of the Mona Lisa, one of the most valuable pieces of art, if not the most valuable uh, in the world. So it's a little bit of, jo of a joke there. Um, another example, freedom of speech is important because people should be able to speak freely. Again, ask yourself, wait a second, freedom of speech is important, the author's conclusion, because, and here's the reason they offer you, because people should be able to speak freely. Well, if you thought to yourself as you were reading this, wait a second, freedom of speech is important, people should be able to speak freely, those aren't saying two different things. It's a circular reasoning, it's begging the question. That's essentially saying the same thing. So it's stating your issue and conclusion as basically uh, the same type of, of statement, right? So when we say that this entails an author providing support for a conclusion that depends on the conclusion already being true, well, in this example and the example about art, um, accepting those conclusions uh, according to these authors is dependent on reasons that do not differ from the conclusion themselves. So if you ask yourself, does the author offer a reason to support the conclusion that's not different than, con than the conclusion itself, and you can say yes, then chances are you come across someone who's committing the begging the question fallacy. And this actually is uh, very common. Uh, I might say this is uh, common if any of you watch presidential debates. Uh, I've identified many instances in watching presidential candidate debates where someone will ask a question and then they'll state their stance on something and the reasons that they give to support the conclusion uh, really entail that circular reasoning or begging the question. So uh, that's the video lecture on logical fallacies. As I said, the chapter in asking the right questions goes into much greater detail about some of those other fallacies we didn't discuss. The goal here is not to uh, stress out about memorizing all of these different fallacies, but to keep in mind that fallacies tend to uh, violate those same standards of reasoning, the three that we've talked about here. So I hope that was a good way to help you see some of the connections among the different fallacies. And as we continue to read the Asking the Right Questions text, the uh, Brown and Keeley will also introduce you to some additional uh, logical fallacies. Have a wonderful week. And I'll see you soon, virtually, <laughs> in a particular way. To adopt a particular, uh, critically thoughtful view on the world. And so much of what Berger is talking about, again, using different words, is very similar to what Brown and Keeley are talking about in that first chapter. So he says that critical thinking from a sociological perspective means not taking others' explanations for granted. Right? Just because someone tells us something doesn't mean it's true. And it might be true, but there might be a lot of different ways to look at the world. It also means developing our curiosity. Ah, there's curiosity again, right? An incredibly important primary value of a critical thinker. Right? We want to develop our ability to ask certain questions and to always be primed to ask those questions when we're trying to evaluate someone else's arguments or when we're even trying to evaluate our preconceived thoughts about the world. He says that critical thinking from a sociological perspective also entails understanding that the social world has different levels of meaning. I absolutely love this part of Berger's reading. Think about it. Think about, uh, for example, you're starting a new uh, semester um, in the last week here or so, right? Think about how maybe your professor understands a class and how you as a student understand the class and understand the college classroom and the college context, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that as a professor my view on the class is wrong or that yours as a student is wrong. What it means is that we're differentially positioned, right? We occupy two different positions, you as student, me as professor, in that particular social context. So we're going to see things very differently, right? We come at the world from different viewpoints. And that's a good way of thinking about a lot of different uh, contexts, whether it's in your family, in your interpersonal relationships, uh, at your workplace. Uh